Welcome to Common Ground with Bill Walton, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists, and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics, and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. I'm joined today by my good friend John Tamney, who is a Forbes contributor, editor of Real Clear Markets, policy director at FreedomWorks, and he's the author of a couple of very good books, Popular Economics and Who Needs the Fed. Uh, about po- popular economics, George Will wrote, John is the one-man antidote to economic obfus- obfuscation and mystification. Welcome, John. <laughs> hey, thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. <laughs> We're here to talk about your upcoming book, which was called The, uh, the End of Work. But we got to talking before the show, and you said before the working title was The End of Laziness. Uh, what's The End of Laziness about? Well, I strongly believe that you can't be happy unless you're working hard, that happiness comes from the difficult things, from the blood, sweat, and tears. Yet it's hard for people, or at least it's historically been hard for people to find work that they could actually work hard on. It didn't make them happy. And so my future that I'm describing that I think is already here, that it's going to get greater and greater, is that more and more people will be able to find work that they love uncontrollably, that it would pain them not to do, that they will look for, they'll like Sundays more simply because tomorrow is Monday and I'll be going to do something that reinforces my skills. Um, everyone knows what it's like to be good at something. Most of us like to be, know, know what it's like to be very good at a number of things. The future I'm describing that I think, again, is already here is that more and more people will get to do that which reinforces their talents, but it will be a remunerative job. Well, I remember Michael Bloomberg said years ago uh, his favorite night of the week was Sunday night because he knew he could get in Monday morning and, uh, and get at what he was doing with Bloomberg News. That's the sort of thing you mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I always wondered. I would look at people in finance and investment banking and I, it, I always marveled at investment bankers that the, the hours they worked, and I never don't understood. Don't, don't remind me. <laughs> That's right. That, but but <laughs> but I think what you would agree is that for you, you got to work on Monday and thought, I am going on to the field of play about which something I know endless amounts. I am going to do something that elevates my skills. And it was fun. It reinforced what you were brilliant at. <laughs> well, well, I was a baby banker, and I, I couldn't tell the difference between Sunday and Monday. They just blurred together. <laughs> but the only reason you could do that is because it reinforced your skills yeah. in an amazing way. And, and I always marveled in people that they, could, that they could work those kinds of hours. And it was only when I became a writer and I realized, oh, wow, this is nothing for me to go all weekend writing. I'm doing something that I love. And it made sense. Suddenly, investment banking made sense. These great financial minds were getting up and doing something that it would pain them, in a sense, not to do. Hence, their ability to put in the hours. Their source of happiness is something that would be hard for someone else. Well, one of the themes of your book that I want to dig into uh, is that prosperity, economic growth, creates thousands of jobs that didn't exist just, you know, even a few decades ago or even five years ago. But I still want to drill into this this laziness thing. Explain to me what it is that uh, the relationship, your, your your own personal journey in terms of laziness and, and work. You, you mentioned something earlier about that. Well, I never, I always thought that I might be lazy. I literally, I could not put in the long hours that other people did. I had interests away from work that I had reasons to not do work-related things on weekends. Uh, I would leave work at night, and I thought, oh, I just don't have work ethic. No, I was in the wrong field. I was working at Goldman Sachs. It was a great company full of immensely talented people, and that was the point. The people at Goldman, I was in the equities division. They loved equities uncontrollably. My passion was policy, and so I was trying to compete with people who felt correctly that they were superstars. They were getting up and doing something every day that reinforced their skills. And I was trying to work alongside them. And so the beauty of the world that we're moving into is that more and more we can exit that which does not reinforce our skills and find the kind of work that makes us feel like you did when you showed up for work at Lehman 
and at Allied and the way the people do at Goldman Sachs when they show up every day just dying to get to work, that's, that's going to describe more and more people in the future. They won't be lazy as a result. Well, you make a point in the book, but then you illustrate it with your personal story. The point in the book can be seen as harsh, which is that every year companies tend to uh, move people out, you know, 5, 10, 20 percent, some 20 percent is high, but, but just based on fit and changing business. And you say sometimes that getting moved out can be the best thing that happened to you. That happened to you at Goldman Sachs. Mm-hmm. That was a tough thing. But what uh, what happened next? It was devastating. But the devastations in life are the, what drive the progress. Um, it forced me to think about what I really wanted to do. And I wanted to be an economics commentator. I would look at them on CNBC and think, that is so, I I want to do that so badly, it's what interests me. Well, you don't just become an economics commentator. My book is not something that says this is easy. I became a fundraiser at a think tank, the Cato Institute, that you know well, to pay the bills so that I could become an economics commentator on my own. I was doing my writing my op-eds about the economy at night after work ended. And it was, a rem- it was a very clear signal right there that I was pursuing the right path, that I would work a full day and then do what I really loved at night. Well, of course. Mm-hmm. So I paid the bills so that I, c- I could find the work that did not feel like work. And that, to me, is writing. Most people would look at the hours I put in writing and say, I could never do what you do. Well, of course not. I'm doing what I love. It's not work for me. It's something I have to do. We uh, we share an interest in football. You write interestingly about football and football, what it, what it takes to become a good football player, both in college and in the pros. But you offer up a, a suggestion or a, or a, an idea that I think a lot of people would find intriguing, which is you recommend that uh, college, the football become a college major. Absolutely. Want to amplify? Well, let, let's begin with Mike Holmgren, the future Hall of Fame uh, coach, described learning a playbook as the equivalent of learning Chinese, as learning an all-new language. But learning it while you have 300-pound men who are very fast racing after you, looking to <laughs> knock you on your ass. Football is one of the most complicated cerebral sports, probably easily the most cerebral sport on earth. It's the sport on earth. It's the most difficult <clears throat> one to learn. The people who are great at it aren't just athletes. Rob Gronkowski is a great football player because he is a student of the game. This person that people view as a meathead knows football on a level that, as Bill Belichick describes it, we are able to run, play a totally different game given his knowledge hmm. of the position of tight end. Randy Moss wasn't a great, there's lots of great athletes out there. What made Randy Moss great was that he was, he was the most, the smartest wide receiver to ever play the game. Tom Brady, there's lots of people who can throw a football. Tom Brady's genius was up here. And so I asked the question, why, if you rate, if you're good enough at this difficult cerebral sport to rate a college football scholarship, why would you then waste your time on subjects unrelated to football? Well, you mentioned the superstars. What about for the average average guy that goes in to play college football? I mean, mm-hmm. what, what's, if they're going to be majoring in football, what do they take away if they don't get into the NFL? Well, it's, it's endless. Um, let's be clear that we don't, we don't look askance at people who are business majors because they're not going to get a job at Goldman Sachs, but most of them will not. We don't look askance at journalism majors, even though 99.9% of them will never see inside the building of the New York Times. Yet if someone has the temerity to pursue that which makes them great and that rated them a scholarship that cost theoretically over a million dollars, we say, why are you spending so much time on this, this game? Well, so you look at these people, okay, for one, they're getting to do what they love, but look at how football's evolved. It's such a remunerative sport nowadays. There's so much money behind Mm -hmm. it that you can make a career out of it, even if you never come near the NFL. You look at a state like Georgia alone, there are over 16 coaches just in the state of Georgia, high school, who earn $100,000 a year. 
If you go to Alabama, Alabama's not a particularly rich state, but if you're in the Birmingham area, there are nine coaches earning over $100,000 a year. In Houston, it's over, they're over 14. Why, if you're so good at something, would you not make a career and a life out of it? Well, I think the numbers are compelling. Sports is, or college football, NFL football has become so popular. The money, the revenue that both the colleges and the, and the professional teams earn has not only caused higher compensation for NFL players, but it's created hundreds of thousands of jobs in football that mm-hmm. you don't know, probably wouldn't have existed uh, you know, 25, 30, 30 years ago. Absolutely. You look at Boise State is hardly Alabama when it comes to um, yeah. a big-time program. But its budget for its assistance alone is $2.1 million a year. Um, LSU was fearful of losing their defensive coordinator, Dave Aranda. So the other day they signed an assistant there, four years, $10 million. And so the point here is that as, as, as the U.S. becomes a richer country, there are more and more options in a sport that people love to make a career out of it, even if you never make the league. And I'll just add one thing. They tell football players to spend time in the classroom. But what is going to place you in a better situation for a life and career out of football? Doing well in an English class to get a grade that no one's ever going to see? Or maybe getting uh, getting an interception in the game between Alabama and Auburn, even though you're never going to play in the NFL? You have access to boosters for the rest of your life because you played for the Crimson Tide that will mean exponentially more than anything you did in the classroom. Well, but I I think about it even differently, a little bit differently from that, is that you make a point in the book that Warren Buffett is pretty good at investing, but he'd be pretty bad at being a football player, and he will tell you that himself. And that your larger point, I think, is that you want people to pursue their passion, pursue their craft, and focus on that and do what they think they can do best. Mm -hmm. And so if you take kids that are going into college to play football – Let's let them focus on that. Yeah. You were good enough to rate a scholarship that's very expensive. Why not focus on something that you're immensely good at that has career opportunities well beyond the NFL once you're out? And what a cruel thing to say, no, 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 spend time on biology and business classes. No, 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 no. If you want to work in business, your odds are much greater if you focus on football because (laughs) you, you have endless opportunities there. And, And I think it goes beyond that, that people who are doing what they love are charismatic people. They are people we want to be around. Warren Buffett rates people spend up to $3.5 million to have a lunch with him. Do you think they would if basketball had been his only pursuit? I mean, to your point, Warren Buffett is is an intriguing personality precisely because he gets to do something that that elevates his skills in a very unique way. Well, the I, I, well, I, I got to admit, I read this chapter with extreme skepticism, and I think you've finally gotten me part of the way there, maybe most of the way there. When I mentioned this to Sarah, my bride Sarah, she said, "Oh yeah, well, there's ballet and there's uh, there's art, and just be you know, you could be an art major in college and and still uh, uh, you know not become Picasso, and so why not pursue that thing you love, even though there's no direct." Uh, uh, line to, to, to greatness, and, and even the people that don't achieve greatness, there are lots of things they can pursue. There was this thing a couple of years ago about art history, what a joke art history majors were. Well, it turns out art history majors are among the highest paid uh, uh, graduate uh, graduates of college because art history, don't they don't necessarily go off and study art. They go into art dealership, mm-hmm. and it's a pretty lucrative field. So art history turns out to be a, a, a high-paying occupation. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I love how you put that. That's so crucial. I had the same reaction as you did when people mocked art history majors. There are people who work in dealerships. They'll work at Sotheby's. Uh, there are art history art consultants that billionaires pay them just to help them amass a good art collection. Um, you see this all the time. And so – why would someone pursue something about which they're not passionate? We're lucky enough to live in a country in which you can marry your passions with a career. Um, 150 years ago, you're only unless you were good at, on the farm, you were kind of out of luck. That was your only career option. But thanks to technology and economic growth, 
you don't the, the you're not limited by the farm anymore and so you can now make a career out of your love of wine out of your love of food out of your love of video games we are living in a world that increasingly is defined by work that doesn't feel like it but what's more exciting to me is that no democrat republican whatever your views i see a future of economic growth that's going to free more and more people from work that they just that they tolerate and because they can do that which, that they, with the, which they love, they'll be freed from laziness, which I think is the cruelest malady of all. No one is happy if they're lazy. It, I don't care if you've got a benefactor giving you millions of dollars. You cannot be happy if you're unproductive. Well, let's explore that. We have people that we're talking about, football players. You mentioned artists. I think you've even got the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the <laughs> Beach Boys, but I think most people would view them as outside of our sort of ordinary powers and as a special gift. How does this apply to the ordinary person who's uh, maybe working as a CPA in Peoria right now? Well, you ask the essential question. Some people are going to see this book and they're going to see Warren Buffett, Rob Gronkowski, Mick Jagger, and they're going to say, okay, he's talking about the outliers, and it's a fair point. Well, my first answer to that is, 150 years ago, Mick Jagger was out of luck, and so was Warren Buffett 150 years ago. Uh, all of these people whom we— And elevate, so are we. <laughs> yes, and so are we. <laughs> so are we. Uh, the odds of be, being a success—there's no way I could have been a writer 150. I mean, there's very slim odds, and my audience would have been microscopic because how would I reach people from wherever I live? And so my ability to express my talents, I can say with utter certainty that if I'd had to do a life on the farm, what a disaster I would have been. What an object of ridicule I would have been. And so you would have been lazy. I would have been incredibly lazy. And me too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we thankfully live in a world, we stand yeah. on the shoulders of giants and everything in that they, yeah. this economic growth created myriad ways for us to do work. And so, yes, the book does focus on a lot of interesting outliers, people who got to focus on what they loved immensely and they've become very successful at it. But it also focuses on people that the readers will never have heard of before. Nowadays, if you love clothing, you can make a very remunerative career out of it through Instagram. You can advertise your purchases. You can talk about what interests you in terms of clothing and you will have the most successful clothing companies in the world and betting you. we call them, I learned this term, uh, in, in, uh, influencers. Influencers. There is okay. a career in, now as an influencer. A, we need a college major, influencer. Yeah. And so <laughs> all these other things, nowadays there are people who, my wife watches people much younger than she is, put on makeup on the Internet. And these are, these are people who put on makeup, show people how to do makeup, who have L'Oreal and all the greatest makeup companies in the world fetting them, flying them around the world on expensive trips in the hope that on their makeup shows, on YouTube, that they will promote the makeup that, that they're offering, that L'Oreal is offering. You can make a career out of it nowadays. If you love pets, you can make a career out of designing diets for the family pet. There are doggy diet consultants. The list goes on and on. And didn't I read that somebody's making 150,000 a year as a dog walker? Dog walkers, too. Yes, uh, 150,000 years as a dog walker working 30 hours a week. And so here, this is what we get <laughs> when the economy is growing. The demand for all sorts of goods and services grow. And so if you love pets uncontrollably, if the idea of being around them every day is what you think elevates you, you can make a career out of it. Your, your formulation is, my takeaway is, if you're feeling lazy and not doing things that you find very interesting, re-examine and re-examine something you like working at. And you also make a point that, that uh, even though the Rolling Stones developed an impressive party reputation, um, they didn't start out that way. They were working, and I guess they had a bond where they said they needed to work together, we needed to rehearse, we needed to listen to music, we needed to do what we wanted to do. It was a mania. Benedictine said nothing on us. Anybody that strayed from the nest to, and I won't fill in this to do this, they, they went off to find uh, 
I guess they called them birds in those days. Uh, they were a trader. You were supposed to spend all of your waking hours studying Jimmy Reed, Muddy Waters, Little Water, Howling Wolf, and Robert Johnson. That was your gig. Mm-hmm. And it speaks to, yeah, we're so, when I talk about Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, yes, <clears throat> we're talking about outliers. But we are also talking about people who worked endless hours to get where they were. And why could they? They could because they were doing that which reinforced their skills. And so that's, if you don't like your job, if you feel lazy, what you really feel is that you're in the wrong field. You know right then, if if you're not kind of interested in what's ahead on Monday, that's a sign that you're in the wrong field. You don't, I, there's a chapter in the book in which I say, you don't hate Sunday nights. You hate a lack of capital. You hate a lack of econ- economic growth because in a booming economy, your ability to elevate, to basically offer up your intelligence, to express your intelligence in the marketplace grows immensely. And that's what we're seeing today. <laughs> so you just went in, you went from the sublime to something else. When we're talking about a lack of capital, how does that, how does that interrelate? <laughs> it's, it's sad to say there's always going to be a little bit of investment in everything. You don't but mean capital are, in the, in money in the bank capital, you mean, or do you mean? There uh, are no companies and no jobs without investment first. Okay. And it comes down to the basic truth that when there's lots of investment, with that, there's lots of different economic opportunities to do all sorts of work. Conversely, during periods of slow economic growth, all sorts of skills and intelligence are suffocated. Um, this is another outlier. But does anyone seriously think that if Steve Jobs' parents had stayed in Syria, that he would have created Apple? No. He was lucky enough to be in a country in which he was able to express his unique intelligence in a way that transformed the world. And so you have to have economic freedom to be on the path to an end of laziness or an end of work. Well, well let, let's pursue that. You're, the, you're a policy guy. Mm-hmm. What, are, what does your utopia look like where people are pursuing their, their passions, their work, and, and creating occupations that didn't exist last week? What, what are the, what's the policy prescription here? Uh, it's fairly basic. Um, you want to be penalizing work as little as possible. Sorry, low tax is guilty. Um, I don't think anyone should be penalized. I think Jeff Bezos brought much more to the world than I did. I think his tax rate should be immensely lower because when he pays less in taxes, he doesn't have new needs to fulfill. He's too rich for that. He just invests. And investing new companies and new opportunities are created that didn't exist before. Um, you have to be able to trade freely. Why? What is free trade but our pursuit of specialization? Right. That, right. That's all it is. If I had to make the apartment that I live in, the clothes that I wear, the, the, the food that I eat, uh, the computer that I type on, I'd very quickly die an unemployed, unfed, unclothed, and unsheltered death. Thanks to free trade, I don't have to worry about what I'm awful at. I can focus on what I love and exchange the fruits of my work with others doing what they love. Uh, free trade is just is elementary in this because free trade is just about you do this, I do this, uh, we're all better off in the process. You do that which elevates your unique skills the most. That's what free trade enables. So those would be the two main things. We could throw in stable money that gets in the weeds a little bit. Money is just the way in which we measure our output, and so you want it to be stable. Tamney's Law. As prosperity increases... Laziness rapidly decreases as the range of work options increase so that every individual can do the work that most accentuates his or her individual talents. It's that simple. Uh, When the economy grows, skills are suddenly rewarded in the marketplace that never have been before. My argument in the book is that no one lacks intelligence. No one lacks work ethic. What they lack is an economy that's big enough to reward their unique skills. And you brought up earlier that you grew up reading Sports Illustrated. Sports Illustrated is what taught me that. To pick up Sports Illustrated is to see every week people of different colors, races, genders working immensely hard. Why do they work so hard? Well, if you're in Sports Illustrated, you are doing something that reinforces your skills on a level that's on an amazing level. You've blown my cover. 
You, no you, one's you've lazy. Revealed that somebody asked me what my favorite book was as a kid, and I said it was Sports Illustrated. Sports <laughs> Illustrated is the best magazine on earth. It's something that I never miss. Uh, Sports Illustrated, in many ways, wrote this book, The End of Work, but it's so crucial. Let's shift gears. Uh, we we hear about venture capitalists. I think in this book you talk about venture consumers. What's a venture consumer? And a venture how does that buyer. Work? A venture buyer. Yes. Okay. Um, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm a classical supply side style person. Uh, production drives um, consumption. But I think we leave out, I think our side leaves out the importance of the venture buyer. Uh, these immensely rich people who can buy something early and in doing so, revealing that there's in fact a marketplace for it. What the rich enjoy in a free market is just a preview of what we'll all enjoy. But this is crucial for this book. Um, the GPS initially cost thousands and thousands of dollars, and it was something that very few people had. Uh, the rich were able to buy it. But as a result of them buying it and, and revealing a marketplace for it, it became a common good such that Uber became a company. Remember that shot of uh, Gordon Gecko on the beach in uh, Wall Street where he's walking along with a 43-pound uh, uh, iPhone in his or uh, telephone in his hand, and that was the luxury item in 1984. Or 85. That's right. Uh, automobiles were out of sight for everybody in 1910. Air travel didn't really kick in until after World War II, even though it was available as a luxury item. And there, on and on and on. The, your larger point, though, is that everything we think of as a, as a consumer good now tends to start out as a luxury item. And because people venture to buy things that are untried or different, that drives the cost down. So eventually what started out as a luxury good becomes a consumer good, a mass market good, and a, a telephone that cost $8,000. You can now you know, buy one for $300, I guess. not Maybe not the Apple 10, but uh, other ones, flip phones. But the Apple 10 is instructive, $1,000. Think about the Gordon Gecko st story. He was carrying around a phone that had a half hour of battery life. <coughs> Terrible reception that if you want to make a call from Long Island to Manhattan was going to cost you a fortune. That phone itself set you back $3,995. If you had a mobile phone in the 80s, you were movie producer rich. <coughs> you'd go to Beverly Hills and you'd see the very few of them nowadays that are common. And so... The broad point of, of this, and cars the same way, everything starts out, cars used to be as, as obscure, more obscure than millionaires were, and millionaires were very obscure. The importance of venture buyers in this, beyond the fact that it's a preview of what we'll all enjoy in the future, <coughs> is that venture buyers are what enable all of these careers. Celebrity chefs were a creation of venture buyers. Well, now more and more people can choose a life of being a chef. Um, you look, you look uh, so, so celebrity chefs are, is, is an obvious one, uh, but you look at dog walkers. Why can dog walkers make $150,000 a year? Because people are flush with cash. Why can there be people, can there be wine buying consultants and art, <coughs> and art buying consultants such that people can turn um, a passion for wine and art into a career? It's because we have rich people who have these needs and can express them, and that's why you want to get the government out of the spending business. It's when the rich have money to spend that jobs, endless jobs are created. Well, you make, you give the example of the, uh, the Senate uh, just changing from uh, what BlackBerry to uh, Androids uh, in the last year, even though some of the remark, well, look, everybody else changed six years ago, five years ago, and yet it took that long for them to figure out it was okay. Government, the, the government Purchase decisions tend to look backwards rather than forwards. Mm -hmm. Well, governments, almost by their very nature, are conservative, not in the political sense, but in, in their purchasing sense. They're not willing to take risks. And so the argument I make in the book is that venture buyers, as in individuals, are by, by nature intrepid. They discover new, new wants and needs, whereas government, almost as a rule, blinds the marketplace. I don't care if it's Democrat or Republican. The... Uh, the uh, the BlackBerry example was an apt one. Government, the U.S. Senate stopped buying BlackBerries two years ago. But m market signals, they had put the BlackBerry in the rearview mirror years before that. And so mm -hmm. government is late 
<coughs> so in spending trillions of dollars a year, what it's doing is slowing this natural evolution to better and, and better goods um, that so, inform so, how so we So the live. policy argument is that if people talk about taxing, not taxing, your point is if you leave the tax money that's taxed in the private sector, it's going to put, be put to more productive, innovative, innovative uses, which is going to create diff, more jobs and lower-priced consumer goods. Absolutely. There's a lot of talk about com- computer uh, technology replacing people, you know, self-driving trucks, putting six million truck drivers out of work, uh, on and on. What's your take on that? That is the quickest path to the end of work that I describe. In fact, robots and robotics are what are going to much more quickly enable what's happening right now, whereby people escape work that they can't stand. And the reason for that is basic. It frees people up. It's going to free us from the drudgery. Um, People talk, uh, wax poetic about factory jobs in the past. When they do, they're generally revealing that they've never known anyone who worked in a factory. If you read stories like Playing Through the Whistle about Aliquippa, PA, fathers and mothers worked in those steel mills so that their kids wouldn't have to. Uh, Tony Dorsett, the Heisman Trophy winner from Pitt in 1976, grew up in, grew up in Aliquippa. His father was very explicit. You come in this mill, you may not come out. Get out of here. Mike Ditka's parents the same way, get out of Aliquippa, find Mm -hmm. something new. And it's the same idea with trucks and all this. Robots and robotics, they don't put us out of work. They enhance us as human beings. Imagine what we we would all, we could, if we want to have jobs, we could easily create millions of jobs by getting rid of Wi-Fi and the computer and the ATM machine and the car and the airplane. We'd be unrelentingly poor, but we would all have jobs. What robots do as they free us from the jobs we hate so that we can do what we love. Well, that's the Milton Friedman story. Visit China. The, the dignitaries are showing him around. They show him their, their big construction projects, and he notices that all of the, uh, the workers, and this is in the 50s or 60s when a lot of modern equipment had, had come into use, he noticed all the workers are using picks and shovels, and he turns to him and he says, well, why aren't you using you know, modern equipment to, to dig this? And he said, well, you don't understand. This is a jobs project. He said, oh, well, if, they're, if it's a jobs project, why don't you have them dig with spoons? <laughs> yeah, Friedman did not get along well with the, Chinese, uh, with the Chinese leadership. And it's crucial. If it's a jobs project, well, I've got an answer for you. We all need to eat. Yeah. And so it's easy. If it's about jobs, let's just get rid of all technology and we'll all be working endlessly on the farm every day just to survive. The world we're describing is constantly getting rid of the work of the past because in doing that, that's what enables all these jobs that don't feel like work. That's what enables people to enter the field of goods and of services where they get to do what they love as opposed to to doing what they they need to do just to survive. And that robots are instrumental in this. So the optimistic message from John Tamney is that all this change, we got to look at optimistically is creating greater wealth, greater productivity, and freeing us up to do the things we really want to do. And the people who are afraid that the truck drivers can't find other kinds of work are simply being elitist, and that everybody's capable of reinventing themselves to do something if they're uh, willing to, to do that. Is that, is that, uh, does that sum it up? It's, it sums it up very well. They're being elitist for presuming they want to be in certain kinds of work. Who knows what that is? But also, they're misunderstanding economics. It's where jobs are changing the most rapidly that opportunity is greatest. It's where jobs are being destroyed most rapidly where opportunity is greatest. Aliquippa is not struggling today because the steel mills left. It's struggling because the steel mills stayed too long Hmm. such that there's an outflow of all the talented from there. Where does the talent go? It goes to where... Jobs are being destroyed most rapidly, places like Silicon Valley, where, they ne- where they're never looking in the rearview mirror. And so without question, where growth is greatest and when growth is greatest, the happy result is that more and more people get to do what doesn't feel like work, but that is very remunerative. 
John, when can we uh, expect uh, the end of work? Although I sort of like your other title, "The End of Laziness," <laughs> better. When, when that's published by Regnery, when, when can we expect that? It comes out May seventh, and so it can be pre-ordered now. But it's uh, May seventh is the release date, and I'm very excited about it. And where can, where can we find you to uh, pr- send some comments? Do we find you at Forbes or uh, Freedom Works or where uh, you do we can go? Freedom Works. You can find me at Real Clear Markets, uh, Twitter, Facebook. You. Name What's your it? handle? What, what, uh, uh, at John T- at J Tamney at yeah. J Tamney yeah well John this is fascinating I highly recommend this book it really breaks a lot of uh, my mental paradigms about what works and what doesn't and I thank you for writing the book and thanks for thanks for being here thanks for having me okay thanks John bye thanks for listening want more be sure to subscribe to Common Ground with Bill Walton on iTunes.